Hi. So first, uh, I wanted to say I'm sorry that I couldn't be here uh, yesterday, and um, I, I've been kind of unwell, so I'm glad that I could be here now. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll get through this, or we won't. So let's let's get going. Um, we toss the word safety around a lot in, in the rest world, which is awesome, right? Like, yay, rest is safe, rest is secure. And one of my goals is for rust developers to enjoy all of the benefits of rust without having to worry about how, how these benefits actually occur. How, how do you get these benefits? Well, I don't care. I just get them right. How many of you consider yourselves Rust developers? Wow, that's not very many for a Rust conference. Um, how many of you would like to be Rust developers then? Okay, yeah, that's, that's more what I was thinking I would see. Um, and how many of you are trying to convince your employer that, hey, we should really do this in Rust? Yeah. Um, a anyone just here to hang out in Florence? Yeah, that's, that was my plan, but you know, life happens. Um, while I love that you can benefit from Rust guarantees without having to be fully, um, you know, cognizant of the nitty gritty details, it's useful to also discuss how Rust achieves memory and thread safety and what this means in real code bases, particularly when we're trying to, I don't know, convince somebody that, hey, we should do Rust instead. It's, it's good to know how it happens and then be able to present this in, in a, um, you know, in a, in a real world case study, like, hey, look at this code base, look at the improvements they got from both the performance and a security standpoint. So that's what I'll talk about. Um, I am Diane, and these are my coworkers, Batman and Watson. Um, oh, I got the, uh, sorry, it looks like the dimensions are a little off on there. Anyways, I work for Mozilla on Servo and Mixed Reality as the privacy and security lead. Last year, uh, we shipped an update called Quantum CSS, which my coworker Knox spoke about a bit earlier. What this was is we replaced the styling code um, in Firefox, which was written in C++, with styling code that was written in Servo, which was written in Rust. This was a unique opportunity to quantify not just performance improvements, but also the security improvements that we can get uh, from, from a rewrite in Rust. And this means that we can examine the corresponding C++ and Rust code, and we can actually see the impact and see directly the changes that have occurred. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is give an overview of what memory and thread safety are, how Rust achieves them, and then from a security standpoint, I will discuss you know, what this means and why they matter, and then wrap up with some examples uh, from the Quantum CSS rewrite. If your code can't compile, then it can't break. That's pretty much the premise of Rust. The most common mistakes that we as programmers make will be caught by the compiler, which will then refuse to build an executable. If you don't have an executable, what are you going to do? Nothing. You're just going to sit there. Which is great, right? Because then you aren't shipping vulnerable code that's going to, you know, I don't know, take down a city's infrastructure or whatever. With enough determination, you can still make these mistakes. It might require what I like to call unsafe gymnastics, but you can still get there. And now let's look at why this is a terrible idea. Informally, memory safety means that in all possible executions of a program, there's no access to invalid memory. This is a bit of a circular definition. 
So instead, let's look at what this means practically. It means that we are going to eliminate the following problems. Use after free, double free, uninitialized memory use, null pointer dereference, and buffer overflows. Use after free and double free occur when the program has released the resources, but still references the memory position. It's not good. It can lead to information leakage, out of bounds access, as well as arbitrary code execution, every hacker's uh, favorite thing. Uninitialized memory could contain pretty much anything. Could be garbage, or it could be, you know, the keys to the castle. Um, and the same goes for null pointers. If it's likely that if you dereference a null pointer, you're just going to get access. You're just going to access garbage memory, and you'll crash, which is great. But I know from you know when I did software vulnerability work, the greatest thing you can ever see in a C++ code base is a seg fault or a crash, because that means you know that you have a vector. You don't know how exploitable it is, but it's there. If the pointer does successfully dereference, then chances are you can possibly get uh, some arbitrary code execution. And I know I'm smiling because like from the offensive side, this part is really fun. From the defensive side, though, like it's terrible. It's a terrible idea and it's very stressful and I shouldn't smile. But like that, that face when you like you get that crash, it's awesome. At a high level, there are three ways that languages manage memory. First, we do manual memory management. You, the programmer, get to manage all of the things yourself. You decide when to allocate resources, how much to allocate, when to deallocate. Gives you fine-grained control, but it's prone to mistakes because turns out we're really bad at managing all of that especially as the complexity of our code bases increase. So then what we can do is use smart pointers. Uh, a smart pointer is an abstraction that wraps a raw pointer with some information that helps, uh, that helps, us, that helps the program automatically free the memory. Um, this way, the program doesn't have to wait on the programmer. Some implementations use reference counting. We do use reference counting for some things in Rust. Other implementations use lifetime scoping policies. And then we have languages that are garbage collected. And they have a runtime component that determines if a resource is still in use and what can be destroyed. It's often less efficient than manually, manually managed language. Now here's the problem. Browsers care about performance. Browsers also care about safety. So we have the most performant approach also being the most prone to mistakes. So what are you gonna do? I, I don't know, maybe, maybe invent this whole new language and everything will be great. So can we do better? That's the question. And the answer is yes. Sorry, this is my favorite image to use in a talk, aside from my cats. <laughs> All right, if you've used Rust, you probably have developed a relationship with the borrow checker. Personally, I envision the borrow checker as this omniscient celestial being. I have never won an argument against the borrow checker because it's always right. And it's a simple concept, right? Ownership is a simple concept in theory. There's just a few rules you have to remember. Each variable has a variable, each value has a variable that owns it. Only one variable can own a value at a time. And when the owner goes out of scope, we drop the value. In order to pass the values around as we need to do, you can either move them and transfer ownership to a new variable, or you can borrow it. In a borrow, the original variable still owns the value, just lets another variable use it for a little bit. 
And there are two main rules for borrowing. First, your references need to always be valid. And second, at any time, you either have one mutable borrow or as many immutable borrows as you feel like. And this is the key distinction here because what happens is this prevents what we call mutable aliasing, which essentially means that two variables can't try to change the same memory value simultaneously. It's simple, it's easy, but really it's hard and it's powerful, if that makes, I mean, it doesn't make any sense, but it does, it works. Sometimes our ownership rules can be too restrictive. So we do have an escape keyword, unsafe, that allows you to relax some of Rust guarantees. By encapsulating unsafe code into blocks, we can isolate the source of memory bugs and create safe abstractions that appropriately check that we've upheld Rust safety guarantees. Um, unsafe code, it's, it's not completely lawless, right? We're not just throwing everything out the window and doing whatever we want, right? It just asks that you, the programmer, verify conditions that the compiler can no longer reason about for whatever reason. Memory safety is a huge win. It's great. Love memory safety. But it's only part of the battle. And in fact, you, know, you can do memory safety in other languages. Like I said, you can have garbage collection, right? That's memory safe. But what about threat safety? When I was in school, I, uh, I took a parallel programming class. And I was really glad when it was over because it turns out that parallel programming is hard and it never really clicked with me. Um, and so I've always said that the thing I struggle with the most when I'm programming is the questions with you know, parallel programming and you know figuring out how to do something. And I maintain that parallel programming is hard and that's why I like Rust. I can actually write a parallel program that mostly works the first try, which is not something I ever thought would be possible for me. Rust makes this class, this incredibly difficult class of problems very easy, or at the very least easier. Um, so who here has had to uh, track down a concurrency bug? Who would say that tracking it down was easy? Yeah, no, it's the worst. Um, generally, our brains are much better at sequential reasoning, which is why I reiterate, concurrent programming is hard. What's even harder is debugging it. The errors have poor reducibility because system operations uh, event timings, network um, communication, all of these change from run to run. While there are tools like RR that allow you to record and reproduce things, this it still means that if you don't record like the right run, you can't reproduce it. How do you debug something if you can't make it happen consistently? And then when you are debugging it, it turns out that sometimes what you're doing to debug it changes the bug. Like, it disappears. Like, that's why I have, you know, my beautiful art of Heisen debugging. Because when you say you put in some print statements, print statements are very slow operations, um, instructionally speaking. And so they change how the program executes. And then all of a sudden, your bug disappears and you're like, where did it go? Do I just have to like put in a random pause here in my code? Is, is that really the best solution? Maybe. The root cause of concurrency bugs is invalid resource use, just like memory bugs. And they have similar consequences uh, like um, information leakage and arbitrary code execution. And this is where the power of Rust ownership system becomes clear. 
other memory management tools like garbage collection can't do anything about thread safety. They can't mitigate concurrency bugs. They can't help us reason about parallel code. But ownership can, and it's because of this mutable aliasing. Well, the prohibition against mutable aliasing, rather. So what is thread safety? A data type or static method is thread safe if it behaves correctly when used for multiple threads, regardless of how those threads are executed and without demanding additional coordination from the calling code. All right, what does it actually mean, right? Ownership was designed to mitigate memory vulnerabilities, but it turns out that it also prevents data races. There are no benign data races, ever. If you have a data race, bad things will happen at some point in time. Usually, languages take two, one of two approaches. They limit sharing and mutability, or they require that the programmer manually manage the thread safety using locks, semaphores, etc. All of those things that I never really figured out how to use. But, of course, in Rust, we can have one mutable borrow or as many immutable, bar immutable borrows as you want. Which means that we can never simultaneously have a mutable borrow and an immutable borrow or multiple mutable borrows. Right? Like, so, when we talk about memory safety, this ensures that resources are appropriately freed. When we talk about thread safety, it means that only one thread can ever modify a variable at a time. And furthermore, we know that no other threads will try to reference an out-of-date borrow. Borrowing enforces either sharing or writing, but never both. And the, uh, why aren't you playing? There we go. This is my other favorite. I, I like to talk about thread safety just because I can uh, use some Gandalf in my talks. <laughs> so um, ownership rules prevent multiple threads from writing to the same memory and disallow simultaneously sharing uh, between threads with mutability. This doesn't necessarily provide uh, thread safe data structures. So how do we do that? Types, types are the best. I love types. Every data structure in Rust is either thread safe or it's not. And so we can communicate this to the compiler using the type system, which means that the compiler can then reason about whether something can actually be passed between threads or not. Instead of having a runtime decision, it's all done statically. Which means that we have a multi-pronged approach to safety in Rust. Ownership system prohibits memory safety errors while preventing unsafe data modification and sharing across threads. Then the type system propagates and enforces thread safety at compile time. And the result is that we should be confident that Rust code is less vulnerable than the equivalent C++ code while being as performant or maybe even better, thanks to the ease of concurrency, right? Now that we know why we care about memory and thread safety, let's return to the reason I'm here. As, uh, as Knox said earlier, um, you know, we're, we're talking about a part of the browser that does the styling. The style component um, applies CSS component, CSS rules to a page. It's a top-down process on the DOM tree. Given the parent style, we can independently calculate the styles of the children. This is a perfect use case for parallel computation. The rewrite, rewriting this in Rust was done for performance reasons. It was not done for security reasons. That was just a happy byproduct. 
you can actually write memory safe C code. It's hard, but you can do it. And furthermore, you can formally verify that your C code is memory safe. What you can't do is write non-trivial thread safe code in C. And we know this because we tried. We tried twice to parallelize the styling component in C++ and it did not work. But third time is the charm and third time we wrote it in Rust. Over the course of its lifetime, there have been 69 security bugs in Firefox's style component. Nearly half of the bugs that I looked at were memory management errors. 17% were bounds related, and another 17% were implementation bugs. If we'd had a time machine and could have rewritten this component in Rust from the start, 51, which is nearly 75% of the bugs, would not have been possible. That's a pretty huge chunk of work. I wasn't able to, to, to measure how many hours that we would have spent trying to fix these bugs and how much money it really would have cost. But if you think of that, that's 75% of security bugs that would never have happened, that we never would have had to track down, figure out, fix, ship, and, and hope that people patch their browsers, right? That's, and this is in a single component. What if we'd been able to write everything in Rust from the start? How awesome would that have been? There's a uh, significant overlap between memory vulnerabilities and severe security problems due to the nature of how memory and pointers can enable arbitrary code execution, et cetera, like I talked about earlier. So of all of, of the 69 bugs that I looked at, um, some of them had official security ratings. Some of them were security related, but weren't assigned official ratings. So this is the the dark blue there is the, the security ra rated bugs. Overall, there were 34 bugs that were rated critical or high. And that means that there was, um, uh, 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 that these bugs could result in information leakage or code execution. Critical means that we saw it in the wild. High means we caught it before it was sought in the wild. So I usually group these together. And of these 34 terrible, bad, horrible things, 32 of them were memory related. That's nearly 75% of all security related bugs and 95% of the critical bugs that are memory related. That would have been completely eliminated, right? Um, now, unfortunately, Rust can't defend against implementation mistakes. Um, so while this is, this is great, it doesn't, it's not the whole story. Um, so now what I'm going to do is talk about a particularly interesting case. And it's an implementation bug that happened in the C code and then reoccurred in the Rust code. What happened was there was a global history leakage bug via SVG image documents. It's a trivial history stealing bug, which is bad and so rated security high. What had happened is we had missed just an if statement to check to see if the SVG document was being used as an image. If you know, it's a one, it's a one line mistake and it's easily overlooked. Unfortunately, while we rewrote the style code in Rust, we missed it. We, we just forgot that line. 
there there were automated tests to catch this, but for um we we didn't actually they were disabled. Our automated tests weren't weren't working efficiently enough, so we disabled some of the tests. And it turns out that this is one of the ones that we had disabled. So the mechanism that tested to see if there were any visited rule violations, which would have caught this bug. Um, yeah, so we turned that mechanism off and it couldn't check it. Tests are not in. So this is the real lesson of my talk. Tests aren't useful if you don't run them. Now, so and this highlights the risks of rewriting in Rust. Um, you can re-implement logic errors that you've already solved, which is why you need tests and coverage in order to catch them. And you need to then run the tests, of course. But more importantly, it's not just re-implementing logic errors. You might introduce new logic errors, and who knows how long it'll take you to catch those. All right, so here's some, some beautiful C code. I know that's what you all came here to see, is some C, haha. <laughs> Sorry, it's funny, it's a joke. Okay, so this is the git custom property name at function. And what happened is there was a heap buffer overflow. So at the top, you see the vulnerable C code and there's just a very small change down at the bottom. What happened is we were using the wrong variable for indexing, which meant that we would interpret memory past the end of the array. The result was we would either crash while accessing a bad pointer or copy memory to a string that's then passed to another component. And what's happening here is this um, this m order variable um, stores the ordering of all of the CSS properties, both the longhand ones and the custom ones. Each element is either represented by its CSS property value, or if it's a custom property, it's represented by a value that starts at ECSS property count, which is the total number of non-custom CSS properties. It's all it's all very intuitive, right? Like makes complete sense. In order to retrieve the name of a custom property, first you have to retrieve the custom property value from M order. And then you have to go into the M variable order array and get the course the name at the corresponding index because that's what stores the property names. So you can see how this is just rife for potential for errors. And what happens is we're using a index to access an element of the m variable order array, which a index is supposed to be used with m order, not m variable order. I mean, seriously, how did they miss this, right? What we really needed to do was have this new variable index here that we see with my, my very subtle arrow. Um, because the corresponding element for the custom property is actually in order a index minus the ECSS property count. I mean, seriously, how, how could this ever happen? Makes total sense. Now, so what would some equivalent Rust code look like? This is this Rust code is a direct translation of the C code. The compiler would accept the code because there's no way to determine the length of vectors before runtime. Unlike arrays, whose length is known um, at compile time the vec type in Rust is dynamically sized. However, the standard library implementation of vec has built-in bounds checking and, you know, implemented in such a way that there's minimal performance uh, penalty there. 
So when an invalid index is used, the program immediately terminates, preventing any illegal access. So we still would have had this problem. It just wouldn't have resulted in, um, in the accesses that cause problems, right? I do want to point out that this is not the actual code that we used because the, the Rust code that we actually ship in Quantum CSS uses different data abstractions. Instead of maintaining separate arrays to store the ordering and the name information, we unify them into a single data structure, improving understandability and reducing the likelihood of other similar indexing um, errors. But again, I want to reiterate that even if we'd kept this original, uh, say, non-intuitive data representation, Rust still would have prevented the heap buffer overflow. So at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that Rust makes concurrency easy. But it's, it's more than that. Rust code bases remove the burden of validating memory and thread safety from our shoulders and it allows us to focus on logical correctness and soundness instead. 95% of the critical security bugs in the styling component would have been prevented by default in a Rust code base. And obviously I am a fan of rewriting in Rust, but it still needs careful consideration particularly with security critical components. There were an equal number of bounds related and implementation bugs in the analysis I did. So this is a trade-off that we need to consider whenever we're looking at migrating C code bases to Rust. Um, implementation bugs are often harder to detect and debug than memory bugs. And any rewrite, and realistically any code base, should be accompanied by robust testing, fuzzing, and if we're really having fun, some formal analysis. And there is a more detailed long form blog post about all of this on hacksmozilla.org. So, questions? Um, how many bugs have you had uh, with the new Rust-based engine and how many of those have been security bugs? So how much have been saved? Do you have any statistics? Um, so when I last looked at it, um, the re-implementation of the the, the re-implementation of the history ceiling bug is the only one that I'm aware of and it was a security high bug but I haven't looked at it in a while, so there might have been more, but I'm not aware of them. Uh, so basically some have been saved at least in, you have some expected number of bucks that you will find in time anyway. So what's the diff difference measured in that way? I'm sorry, could you say that again? Um, uh, when you look at how many bucks are found in given time span, uh, what is the difference between the C++ code and Rust effectively? Um, so all of the bugs were, let's see, so those were over the lifetime of uh, Firefox, which I think is since, I don't know, it's somewhere in the decade range. Um, sorry, I'm trying to think. Um, I mean, we always expect to find bugs. But luckily, that's that's one nice thing about having migrating an existing code base, right? We've figured out a lot of problems. We have tests to catch a lot of problems, provided that we run them. Um, and, and so a lot of the problems that we would have encountered if we were writing this from scratch are already solved and caught. Um, 
Sorry, I don't think I'm answering your question well. No. Uh, um, how many security bugs did you find in the last two years you had the C++ code base compared to the number of security bugs? Oh, I, d I don't have that information on hand. I would have to look at it. Sorry. Are you using any model verification tools in Mozilla? And if you if you don't, like, can you recommend any model verification tools? Any model checking, formal verification tools. Um. So, we the only formal verification tools that we are currently deploying in Firefox that I'm aware of is we have a formally verified implementation of TLS called Hacklestar. Um. And I, one of the things that I'm currently working on is trying to figure out how we can better integrate, like how can we make it so that you can integrate formal verification tools with your Rust code? And what does that look like? And what do we need to, to do to make that happen? Um, there is a working group if you're interested. Yep. You should join. Hello, nice talk. Could you just explain what is a visited rule violation? Oh, right. Um, a visited rule violation is um, so if you've like visited a link on a page, it the, the the color of the link is changed, and so that's controlled by styling. And so if um, so the problem is you don't want to accidentally leak that information and that would be leaked via the styling component and so things can like a script could query the color of the link and then be like oh hey they've looked at this before oh, ho, 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 ho. so thank you thank you um is it working? Yeah. Uh, what are the overall goals for Firefox? Is it now? Is it like the goal to replace uh, everything with uh, with Rust, or is it that you say, okay, some components that make sense, or uh, and others are left to other solutions? Um, no, we are not replacing Firefox with Servo. Uh, this what happened was this was a pretty unique case in which ca it, where we had a very modular component and even with the modularization it was a lot of effort to you know essentially rip out a component <laughs> and put a new one in uh however i think it was very successful so what we don't that i am aware of have any current plans to rewrite other full-scale components in Rust. However, I do know that some teams on the Firefox side are starting you know, new projects in Rust rather than new projects in C++ because it does, you know, it, it is so easy to integrate the two code bases with both languages. Um, what we're really doing is Rust has some really impressive benefits for um, so I also said I work on the mixed reality team. So that means, you know, I immersive, the immersive web, virtual reality and augmented reality. And one of the really amazing things about Rust is because we can get more performant code, we can do things like render web pages at um, better frames per second. And it turns out that that's pretty key in the world of, you know, I immersive realities because if you don't have good enough frame rates, you make people sick. If people are sick, they're not gonna use it, right? So what we're doing is we have Servo and it's our experimental um, browser platform for immersive web technologies. Does that answer your question? All right, yeah, thank you okay. again. Thank you, thank you again. <laughs>